Um, why does a natural event turn into a disaster? And I'm going to go through the steps why that happens. But I'm going to illustrate everything with the one hazard that I know particularly well, an earthquake. But everything I'm about to say today is relevant for any hazards, whether they're natural or man-made hazards. So it's worth having a think about how broadly applicable these ideas are. So first, really quickly, I mean, just a couple of slides, quick 101, what is an earthquake? An earthquake, quite simply, is the sudden release of energy in the ground. Uh, usually along the big fractures called faults. And what usually happens is some, the ground moves in that earthquake. It, the energy makes the ground move and you see often sometimes slip on the surface. So this is an example where in California, where these fields were, were moved sideways by about 50 centimeters of this earthquake. Just another example in the Nevada desert, where in this case, a big earthquake moved this old dry river valley, riverbed by about four meters across. So this is what often happens in an earthquake. And just so, so this is a simple model here of an earthquake rupture. This red line is, is, is a fault looking down from the top. And the top half of the, of the ground is moving to the right, and the bottom half is moving to the left, tectonically speaking. And, but the fault is stuck. But the, but the tectonic plates are always constantly moving, so, but the fault is stuck. And so what happens is you get slow buildup of energy. You might call it strain energy or pressure or stress, whatever you want to call it. Up, up to a point where the fault, uh, fault has enough and decides to rupture and releases all that stress in what we call an earthquake. And quite simply, it's a sudden release of that energy that causes an earthquake. But where are the world's earthquakes? This is a map I'm hopefully you've seen before. It's a map of all the global earthquakes around the world. And uh, in the oceans, it's quite nice that you can see these long linear bands in the oceans, particularly down the Atlantic. You can see this really sort of narrow bands, and that we've recognized that since the 60s and 50s. And you know, this is where the peck tectonic boundaries were put. And this was in a, in a, quite innovative in the 60s. But I want to draw your attention to the central bit here, Central Asia. In the oceans, you get this long line of earthquakes. They're no wider than about 100 kilometers. In here, between, between northern India and, northern, and southern Mongolia, it's 3,000 kilometers long, that, that distance. So, you can't stick a line through it and say, this is the plate tectonic boundary in the continental interiors. So quite simply, plate tectonics in its original form doesn't actually work in the, in, in the continents. There's much more at play here in terms of why earthquakes are happening there. And that's the topic of a lecture another day. But I just wanted to make, make there's two sets of rules we're playing with. One rule for the ocean and one set of rules for the continents. So earthquakes on the continents are, are what we call distributed. They don't happen on narrow zones. And what happens in an earthquake? This is the meat of the talk today. Um, what happens in an earthquake? You know, sadly, people fortunately die in them. And this is a graph of, the, on the bottom, the size of the earthquake in moment magnitude. And on the left, going up the axis, is the number of fatalities that have happened in them. And we can make the simple assumption to begin with that big earthquakes tend to kill more people. And if, by looking at this graph, we can, that's more or less right. There's, there is a sense of, sense of positive trend where big earthquakes kill more people. But my contention in this talk is that, <laughs> my contention is that it's not so simple. I'm gonna illustrate that with some examples. So this year is in Nepal, 2015, uh, where 9,000 people died in an unfortunate earthquake. This year is the largest earthquake we've ever measured, uh, magnitude 9.5 in Chile in 1960. That killed around 3,000 people, which is still a lot of people, but that earthquake was the same as 180,000 nuclear bombs going off at the same time. So it's an enormous earthquake, but it still killed quite only a few thousand people. I say only, but that's a lot. This is Haiti in 2010, which you may have seen in the, remember seeing in the news. A magnitude 7.1 earthquake killed around 100 to 300,000 people. That's a lot of people to kill in one earthquake. In a similar, in the same size earthquake, a magnitude 7.1 in Pakistan, a year later, only three people died. So why does the same size earthquake in Pakistan kill three people when Haiti killed 300,000 people? And this is the meat of what I'm trying to explain here today, why that's the case. And this is the answer. So I'm gonna start my talk by telling you the answer. The answer is these four. These are the four things that make, that turn a natural hazard into a natural disaster. And there are two very different things. The first is an exposure, exposure 
poverty, corruption, and ignorance. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to explain what I mean by each of these four. Each of them alone is a worthy of its own lecture, but I'm going to try and condense it and tell you in the short version. But because I couldn't, you know, resist the temptation, I call these the four horsemen of disaster risk. So if you remember, you'll remember them as the four horsemen later on. So first, exposure. What do we mean by exposure? Quite simply, it's where do people live? Where are they? And what kind of buildings do they live in? So, and we know the first one quite well. We've been producing maps of the world's population for decades now. This is a map from NASA using satellite imagery to really map the population density, densities around the world. And you know, we, we've all seen maps, similar maps to this. And there's this, you know, there's this huge zone of high de highly dense populations from China all the way across India, through the Middle East, into, into Europe. So there are parts of the world that have loads of people living in them. There are other parts of the world, like North Africa or Northern, Northern Eurasia, that are empty. And that matters when it comes to their people's ability, vulnerabilities and exposure to natural disasters, hazards even. The other part of this equation is what kind of buildings do people live in? And that's a harder thing to do, because we can't go around the world counting all the buildings that exist and sort of saying what kind of buildings they are, what kind of, how, how strong they are, or how vulnerable are they to shaking? Because quite simply, there are too many for it. We can't do that. So we are coming up with, with sort of innovative methods using Google, using satellite data, to sort of build up a map of all the world's buildings and, and characterize them by type. And we've been doing that at the BGS. We currently released this data set for all the least developed countries in the world, freely for anyone who wants to use it. But, you know, it's still a big challenge because buildings change all the time. Even in here in this, in Kenilworth, that feels like it hasn't changed sometimes since I last came. There are new buildings going up all the time. And this matters because the exposures change dynamically like that. Uh, this, is, this is an example of it's a bit of work I did in Santiago, the capital of Chile. This is a map from the American spy satellites. Again, another topic altogether. Americans unsurprisingly, have been spying on the world for decades. And this is one, of the, and in a few years ago, they released all these old satellite images for free, uh, openly. So this is a picture from 1970. The Americans are spying on the world in 1970 using satellites that, you know, we would have dreamed of, we would not have dreamed of at the time. This is a map of Chile. This red line here is um, the, a, a fault that we were working on. And all the other white stuff are, are the towns and buildings in that city. And this is the same image in 2014. If I show you next to them, you'll hopefully, it's hard to see on this image, is that there are more buildings on top of the fault now. Because the city has expanded over, over the last three, four, five decades, the city has grown over the active tectonic faults. And this earthquake, has, this fault hasn't had an earthquake in that time. So people have forgotten that they are now living on top of an earthquake generating fault. So this is the change in exposure that's happened over a number of decades because the city has expanded over time. And these are three good, good examples. Oh, you can have all these slides later on and, and sort of prove them at your leisure uh, in detail. And so if we draw a map of all the global fatalities, fatal earthquakes, and, and characterize them by size, so the bigger the square here, the more earthquake people it's killed, sadly, in an earthquake, we can make the first assumption that along the world subduction zones where one plate is pushed underneath another, you get the biggest earthquakes. So you, the initial assumption would be that's where you should get the most fatalities and along by the yellow lines. And clearly there are lots of fatalities there, but in fact, the most fatal earthquakes happen in that red circle there, away from the world subduction zones. And in fact, 85% of all the world's fatal earthquakes in the last thousand years happened in that red circle away from the global subduction zones. So location clearly matters. And what we say is some countries have a higher exposure to earthquakes. Size does matter too, right? So these I get here are all the fatalities from subduction zone earthquakes, the, the ring of fire earthquakes, and by size and fatality number. And you can see, you know, there's quite a lot of people. There have been two big magnitude nine earthquakes in the last uh, 100 years that have killed nearly uh, half a million people. That's a lot of fatalities and, and several, uh, quite a few number of magnitude eights have done the same thing. But if I plot on top of this, the earthquakes from the continental interiors away from the subduction zones, it looks like that. Right, so blue. Blue is from the continents, red is from the ring of fire earthquakes. 
the first thing we notice is that blue graph is further to the left. There are more, the earthquakes tend to be smaller than the subduction zones, but they kill way more people. So the conclusion from this is that most fatalities from earthquakes happen in earthquakes that are magnitude between magnitude seven and eight in the continental interiors, away from the, the, the subduction zones, which is something maybe counterintuitive because the big ones you hear about in the news, the tsunami making ones, tend to be on the ring of fire. But they don't actually kill as many people as we think they do. Uh, that's exposure. The second horseman. It, this is probably my favorite one because it's actually a good news story that has unfortunately become a bad thing. Let's start with the good news. Um, this is a map of the world's population. Um, as you can see, from the, in 1800, there's around 1 billion people in the world, and now there's around 7.5 billion people. So the world's population has increased, and we all, we've, we all sort of hopefully know that. But if I were to plot on that, the number of people who have lived in extreme poverty in the world, so extreme poverty is really well defined. You, it, it's defined that in such that you, earn, you don't earn enough money to feed yourself on a daily basis. So, you know, they, these are absolute poverty levels. And every single person in that red zone could not feed themselves on a daily basis. And that's, and it's a crime. I believe it's one of the biggest crimes we have in the world today that people still live in extreme poverty. But if you look in 1800s, there was about 1, mil, 1 billion people living in extreme poverty. And over time, it, the number has gone up slowly with the world's population increasing until around about 1960, then it started falling. Even though the world's population increased, the number of people living in extreme poverty started decreasing. And if you do it as a percentage, this is the percentage, the blue line. In 1820, 94% of the world lived in extreme poverty. 94% of the world couldn't feed themselves. And now it's around 8% of the world. That is probably the best good news story I hope I can tell you today. And that number is still going down. COVID has had a small change on that, but hopefully that's, a, that's going to hit zero in the next 20 years time. And that's the best news story I can tell you. In fact, it's such a good news story that all the world's media could have run this headline. 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty since yesterday. All the world's media could have run that headline every single day for the last 25 years. That's how many people come out of poverty every day. So that's a brilliant news story. But why, why, am I, why have I turned it into a horseman? It's because of this. This is the kind of buildings people who live in extreme poverty live in. They, they're usually made of local materials, wood, mud, straw, that kind of stuff. And they, these are actually quite amazingly, wooden buildings are amazingly resilient to earthquakes. They bend and sway and they absorb the energy of, of the ground shaking. People are coming out of extreme poverty, but this, remember, these are still really, really poor people. They're just not extremely poor people. So by any measure of our Western standards, they're still extreme, really, really poor. So, but, they, but they, they start getting some money. And what do they want to do? They want to get those luxuries in life that we sometimes take for granted. Electricity, taking the kids to school, building themselves a home. And this is a photo I took in Bangladesh. So this family in the back lives in the, in the background. That's their house made of bamboo and mud. And they're slowly coming out of poverty and they want to build themselves a home. So that's what, how they do it, with the bricks. But notice some things about this house. First, because they're so poor, they can't afford too many bricks. So if you go outside and look at all the homes here, all the bricks are flat. And here, because if you, if you stand the bricks side on, you can, you can build a wall with fewer bricks, right? And so they use fewer bricks. But that wall is weaker now because the actual contact of the ground is, is a narrower point. So that wall is weak compared to if you'd build the bricks flat. Here's another example. And the strength of a house is around its pillars. If you look around you in, this, in, this, in the church, you see lots of big pillars here. The strength of the, of the room is being built, supported by these big, strong pillars. The thinner the pillars are, the, the weaker they are. So this house here on the left, in the same village, the family's moved out to the tin home, into this brick house, again with the bricks side on, and the, but now with thin, narrow pillars. This house is fundamentally weak when it comes to earthquake shaking, they'd be safer in the tin house. So what we say is the jump from extreme poverty to just poor, which by any standard is still poor, quite, quite poor, puts them at a higher risk to earthquake shaking, even though it's a good thing socially 
This is no a dilemma we fall into, but that's worth remembering. Simple all hazards, and it's worth repeating this sort of old idiom that adage that Nicholas Ambrosius said that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings do. Uh, and the types of building you're in at the moment of the earthquake really matters. Third one. This is my favorite horseman because uh, uh, it, it's, it's one that's very notorious and hard to define. But we will, we will try and define it. Corruption. We'll define it as the misuse of entrusted power for private gain. So I trust you to do something. And when you don't do it, that is a form of corruption. And we know that corruption kills. And we know that corruption is a cause of much suffering around the world for, on, on, all, on all fronts. But our case is we're talking about earthquakes. So what, how does corruption manifest in earthquake fatalities? This is one example. So this is what I would call the golden ratio. Those of you with a bit of engineering background will, will know that to make a strong mortar cement, you mix uh, three bags of sand with one bag of cement. I mean, it depends, of course, there are lots of nuances, but this is an average sort of simplification. Three bags of sand, one bag of cement, mix it with some water, that gives you a really strong cement that you can build your house with and you'll be a strong house. But if you happen to be a little bit of a corrupt contractor, what you do is this. You get six bags of sand and one bag of cement because cement is expensive and you pocket the money for that extra bag of cement. And, and the, the mortar looks the same, it probably feels the same, but it's not the same, it's, it's weaker. And when that earthquake comes and shakes your house and rattles everything around, the one that suffers the most is the one with the weaker cement. So that's a form of corruption. And that's hard to see when the building's all finished and looking nice at the end. Another form of corruption is that you don't, they don't build the homes properly. So remember I said the, the strength of a pillar, uh, uh, a house are in the pillars, and the strength of the pillar is in the rods, the rebar rods. You may have seen them construction sites around. The more rebar rods you have in that pillar, the stronger that pillar is. And we, when we talk to, to, uh, to masons in poor countries, we say you should have at least four pillars, rods in, the, in each pillar. The, but the more you have, the better, but at least four. And, but you know, if you're a corrupt contractor, what you do is you put one rod down and pocket the money for three, fill the rest up with cement and no one knows. No one can see inside that pillar. And that's a corruption, that's a form of corruption that makes that, house that whole house weaker when it comes to shaking. Another form of corruption is putting buildings where, they shouldn't, where there shouldn't be buildings. Putting buildings in, un, un, in unsafe places. In almost every country, actually in every country in the world, there is a planning application process where authorities decide where buildings should be, where they should, shouldn't be, based on various safety criteria. This is, a, this is a picture from Turkey. These homes are on this hill slope. And this hill slope is already unstable. You can see parts of it already failing on, on the right. This still won't need an earthquake. Uh, heavy rainfall will, will make these slopes come down in a landslide. An earthquake will most certainly make these slopes come down in a landslide. So these buildings have been put there illegally with poor planning permission or with sort of corruption. You pay your sort of inspectors and they don't, they, they don't, they don't sign the form off. And so that is another form of corruption, this sort of illegal sort of activity. Uh, I guess every country has planning application process. But you know, the government inspectors are often underpaid in poor countries, as is everyone in poor countries. They're all underpaid and you know, everyone needs to you know, feed their children. So what they do, they take a little bribe and they don't tell anyone about this activity they've done. And this, is, you know, this makes the whole process unsafe. If you can bribe your inspectors, it means you don't have to build your house as strongly or as well as you probably should have, as you probably should. So, you know, how do we measure corruption? It's quite a difficult thing to do, right? So, you know, you can't go to the government of China and say, how corrupt are you on a scale of one to hundred? Can you, and they're not going to answer. <laughs> no, no country will answer that. So it's a notoriously difficult thing to, to, to measure. However, these guys, Transparency International, do do this using various surveys and sort of other sort of proxies of corruption. They do make a measurement of it and give every country in the world a score between zero and 100 every year. So 100 is a country that's, that's angelic, no corruption whatsoever. And zero is a country that's completely and absolutely corrupt. And, and thankfully or unfortunately, no country scores zero, but no country scores 100. Uh, the yellow colors here are the, one, the countries that do well, are, are, least, are least corrupt. 
and the red countries are more corrupt. Um, in case you wanted to know, the, the least corrupt countries in the world at the moment are countries like New Zealand, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Scandinavian countries, and New Zealand. Probably not a surprise to many of us. The most corrupt countries in the world at the moment are countries like Somalia, Syria, Afghanistan, uh, also probably not a surprise. Um, um, but what matters is this. These are the five most fatal earthquakes this century, since the year 2000. And they all happen in red countries, red or orange countries. And this really matters. But, and if you think about it, right? If you think on a score of 0 to 100, 50 is the middle point, okay? If you're 50, it means you're not corrupt, you're not fully corrupt or you're not fully angelic, you're just in the middle person, right? So two thirds of all countries in the world fall below 50, i.e. they are more corrupt than not. Two thirds of all countries in the world. And if you put this against, this get the score on the left is the corruption. In this case, it's the number between 0 and 10, but it's the same idea, not 200. Uh, and the bottom is the, the income for that country, the GDP or gross national income. And interestingly, if you put the two together, it makes a straight line. And the idea of this graph is that if you fall on the line, you're just as corrupt a country as we expect you to be based on your income. So countries like Japan, the US, fall on the line. We, UK, falls on the line. We're just as corrupt as, we, as our model predicts you to be. If you fall above the line, you're a less corrupt country as we expect you to be. The countries like Chile, New Zealand fall up there. If you fall below the line, you're, you're more corrupt than we expect you to be. Countries like Mexico, Russia, Greece, Italy fall below the line. And why does this matter? Why does corruption matter? It matters because the construction industry is the most corrupt segment of the global economy. These guys are building your homes, right? Building your offices and building your businesses and building your skyscrapers. The construction industry is the most corrupt segment of the world economy. So if I were to color this in to make it easier for us all, these are the good guys. Uh, these are the bad guys because they're more corrupt than we expect them to be. These guys are, are, are where I give me sleepless nights. These guys down, these countries down there are poor, corrupt, and they don't know what's going on. And this is often where you get the most fatalities. In fact, 83% of all deaths from earthquakes in the last 30 years happened in countries that are poor and anomalously corrupt. So corruption kills, literally. So, brief aside now, uh, why do buildings fall over in an earthquake? And the answer is really simple. It's because of, of gravity. Everything wants to go horizontal. The fatal attraction of gravity is what I call it. Everything wants to go horizontal. And earthquake, the ground shaking and the, the ground shakes an earthquake and the building goes, oh, I can go horizontal now. And any opportunity it can get do, it does that. So the, gravity is what makes buildings fall. And some buildings are safe, as I just saw earlier, the wooden buildings, single story, thatched roofs, those kind of buildings are safer than sort of poorly built concrete structures. Um, and we have also top heavy structures. You may see these in the news a lot. So in the UK too, you have these big, big tower blocks with the ground floor as an open shopping center with the residences on residential buildings, residential homes on, on the top floors. And the ground floor, because it's a shopping center, there are no walls. There's just big open space and lots of glass, right? And it's just perfume and things like that. For people to buy. But that ground floor is weak because it doesn't have all the walls that the top floors have. So in an earthquake, what you get is what we call pancaking. Um, and you can probably guess what happened. The whole thing just pancakes down onto the ground floor. So they, actually, if you're on the top floors, you're probably quite safe because the entire energy is absorbed by pancaking the ground floor down. So this is what often sadly happens in, in Asia at the moment in earthquakes. They're what we call top heavy or bottom weak structures. This is a really good example of an earthquake in Turkey. The building on the right here uh, is made of wooden frame and the building on the left is a concrete structure. Concrete can be a really safe building type to live in if it's built properly. This one on the left wasn't built properly. You had a weak beam on the ground floor and it sort of toppled over. The, the building on the right was made of wood. We've been building with wood for centuries and we know how to do it. And clearly this one survived. One thing you'll notice in this frame is, hopefully you can see, is all the triangles in the frames, all the, all the bits of wood. And if you remember from school classes, a triangle is one of the most rigid shapes you can make with, with, three, with three sides. So 
And the more triangles you have in your structure, the more rigid it is, the more resilient it will be to shaking, even if it is made of wood. So bad design. This is why this is a photo I took in Bhutan, this high in the Himalayas. And on, by any measure, this is a really well built. Uh, it's it's going to be a residential block, I think it's eight floors high. The pillars are enormous. They're really, really gigantic pillars with lots of rebar rods and all, all, they did everything right from the engineering point. However, I'm going to draw your eye to this bit here, the outer wall, and I'll zoom into you right here, what I'm in here. In a normal building, you have a bit the pillars, uh, the four pillars, and you put the bricks in between the pillars. And then you still just sort of cement everything in. <laughs> For some reason, they've decided to put the, pillar, the bricks here on the outside of the pillar. And so what happens in an earthquake? The whole thing shakes. The building, because it's built so well, so robustly, the whole building may stay standing, but all that brick is gonna come raining down. And one of the reasons why we tell people, if, you have, if you're unfortunate enough to be, ever be in an earthquake, don't run outside. It is probably the, one of the most unsafe things you can do. Uh, while it's still shaking, there's bricks raining down, and that's often what hurts people the most. There's bricks raining down on you. It's almost always safer to be inside, under a table, until the shaking has stopped, and then you can run outside. Because of all things like this, bricks falling down. And so this is probably what I call the fourth horseman, what I call ignorance, or it's a horrible word, but it's a sort of emotive word. It's, maybe they just didn't know that the, the bricks had to go in between the pillars and not in front of the pillars. Uh, it's a hard one to say why they did this. I didn't ask them. <laughs> I just took the photo. Um, and so we, when we come back to this idea of one rebar rod versus four rebar rods, uh, most homes in the world, I think 90% of all homes in poor countries are built by the homeowner with no formal training in how to engineering in, in, in architecture. They just put a rod down, put some bricks up, and that's their home. They have no training whatsoever. So that sort of level of ignorance, it's not born out of the, the, no sort of ill will, it's just they didn't know how to do it. So one of the really successful programs at the moment is in Nepal, trying to train local masons to go into villages to train people up on how to use. It only costs 10% more money to make a house relatively resilient to earthquakes. So it's not a money issue, it is, it is a little bit of a money issue, but mostly it's, it's a knowledge issue in, in some of these places. And here's some simple things you can do for those engineering minds out there. This is a picture of a, a pillar that's been pulled out to the foundations in an earthquake. And this is a, quite a simple fix to this. Trees have been doing it for millions of years. You, what, the trees don't go straight down, they go down and they buttress out. They flare out at the base, right? It's because it, that base, the flaring of the base, gives it a stability that it's, it, nature has evolved it over millions of years, that it's figured out that if it's not, it doesn't flare, you get pulled out. So we could do the same with the rebar rods, right? We don't have to just, we just stick them straight down. We can stick them straight down and bend them out a bit on the bottom. It doesn't cost any more money. It doesn't cost any more cement. It just flares out and that whole thing becomes a little bit more rigid to being pulled out of the ground. As another example, this is actually in California. They learned this lesson the hard way. Um, again, a pillar, really big pillar, lots of rebar rods go down, everything right, until the earthquake made the bridge collapse the, the vertical shake and the whole thing just squashed and the pillar exploded outwards. And the fix to this one is also really quite straightforward. All you do is add stirrups on your rebar rods. And if you, if you walk past the construction site, watch this, you'll see every 15 centimeters, there's a little stirrup bar going up the pillars. And all that does adds that strength, that sideways strength. So the rebar rods gives it strength in that direction, in the vertical direction, and the stirrups add strength to the explosion outwards. And it doesn't cost that much money because these stirrups are really cheap things to, to put together. It just costs a little, makes it just needs a little bit more time to put it all together. So that's again, a very straightforward fix. This is my, my, my biggest bugbear. And those of you who've managed, who have traveled in Asia will probably see this a lot. So in, in the corners are probably the weakest spot in a concrete building because you have rebar rods going up and the and the and the and the pillar and the, sort of the, the pillar horizontal pillar with the rebar going rods going across. And in the corners, what most people do is they chop off the chop the ends off, and that's it. That's your that's your that's your pillar. But in an earthquake, what happens is everything's moving around, and the pillar horizontal pillar can just get pulled out like that. 
And it's really quite easy. It just gets pulled down. The whole thing will just collapse. And the fix to this is really quite straightforward. All you do is instead of chopping the rebar rods off at the end, you just bend them in. You bend them in, cement it all in, and that corner is now really, really rigid and strong. It doesn't cost any more money. It's a simple engineering fix. And that, but that makes that corner really strong and therefore resilient to, to the shaking it's about to get subjected to. This is what happens when buildings aren't built properly. And this did not need an earthquake. This collapsed on its own without an earthquake in Bangladesh. In 2013, a factory collapsed that killed around a thousand people, over a thousand people. And it was just poorly built, poorly designed, poorly used, and it collapsed under its own weight. And what I worry about is Bangladesh is in an earthquake zone. It hasn't had a big earthquake in a long time. So the memory of the earthquake is, is lost. So what can we do to make these homes safe? We can, we can retrofit them, we can identify them. There are things we can do now to make these buildings safe. And we, we want to be able to do, we want to be doing that. We are doing that, but you know, it's wasting its time. We don't know when the next earthquake is going to be. Okay, that's half of my, most of my talk. I'm going to give you a little bit of, a bit of an aside now. So I've talked about sing, a single hazard, earthquake, the one that I know the most. But the world, unfortunately, isn't so simple. We're all subject to many hazards. Even the UK has its own set of natural hazards. And this is an example I'll give you from Istanbul, Turkey, where I did some research for my PhD a number of years ago. Istanbul, there's a big active fault going through the city, to the south of the city called the North Anatolian Fault. That's where I worked at. And in the past, it's created gigantic earthquakes. In fact, in 1505, it destroyed Istanbul, Constantinople, some people uh, at the time it was called. And they call, it was called the Lesser Judgment Day. Because at the time they thought, you know, it was, it was, it was always God's will that uh, it was going to be destroyed and etc. So, you know, Istanbul has an earthquake problem. And we've known this for centuries. It also has a landslide problem. It also has a drought problem. It also has a flood problem. It also has a, 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 a heavy rain problem. It also has a hailstorm problem. It also has a fog problem. It also has a snowstorm problem. So, you know, as an earthquake scientist, I can't go to the government of, of Turkey or the municipality of Istanbul and say, you need to sort your earthquake problem out. And they say, yeah, but where, which, where do we sit in front of all these other ones you have to worry about? Right, so, you know, the world is more complex than any one individual has it. And I'm going to make it even more complex for you because <laughs> these hazards interact with each other. So one hazard can trigger another one, and then that triggers another one. So you can get sort of knock-on raining cascade of these hazards happening. And to try and understand this, which was, we sort of characterize all these hazards in Istanbul. We call them into like 23 big broad hazards. You don't need to worry about what details are, but we include things like earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, lightning, tornadoes, fog. Uh, wildfires, extreme temperatures, hot and cold. So we sort of characterized them all and sort of found, tried to find examples of where one hazard has triggered another one. And please don't worry about the details. It's just to show you, we, we tried to do this systematically, trying, okay, let's find examples of when an earthquake has triggered a flood, or when a flood has triggered a landslide, or and that landslide has gone on to trigger something else. We tried to find examples of one hazard triggering another, and we found loads. Unfortunately, and that's what I mean by lows on this, on this big scatter graph here. But I'm going to illustrate it with just one example. These are what I call domino hazards. So think this is a hypothetical example. An earthquake, we know, can trigger tsunamis. We've seen that in the news a lot. Earthquake can also trigger landslides. Hopefully, that's quite an intuitive thing. Landslides can then block a river, and the river floods and causes a flood. And that's a simple a more, a scenario that we can think of. And this has happened in our memory. This is an example of it. In 2011, there was a very large earthquake in Japan, the Tohoku earthquake. It, was, it made headlines all over the world, a Mansion 9 earthquake. And we saw these images of this tsunami it created. It really quite, well, probably the most well-documented tsunami in history. Because there were helicopters flying over it as it came into crashing onto the, into the ground. So that earthquake triggered a tsunami. That earthquake also triggered a landslide that broke this dam that caused a flood. But this, earthquake, this event had another knock-on effect that we will all remember. That tsunami caused that nuclear power plant to explode. 
if you remember that. So this is where the natural world is interacting with the human world to make the whole thing a bigger disaster than any one of these would have otherwise be. Right, so this is what we call a multi-hazard problem where the natural human world are now sort of mixing and causing chaos everywhere. So to give a simple example, this, this, the dynamic risks, we need to be worried about this now, where things are cascading and triggering things. About, you know, why does it matter to us as people? I'm going to illustrate that with a simple example. Imagine this is a, as a city. Any, a city in anywhere in the world, well, hoped by the sea. Mo many big cities live, are by the sea because the sea is a good source of transport. And often, sadly, especially when they're in fire, they are also in earthquake zones. So what happens? They have an earthquake in these areas. Buildings shake, people run outside after the shaking, remember? You run outside after the shaking is finished. <laughs> Do that. But you're by the coast. You have 15 minutes. Because guess what's coming? That tsunami is coming and you should be running as fast as you can uphill. If the shaking lasts more than about 45 seconds, you start running as fast as you can, as high as you can. Because that tsunami is coming. If it doesn't come, it means you get some exercise. But you know, it's better safe than sorry. And that tsunami comes and floods. And so that's this, this, this gentleman here did the right thing. Wait for the shaking stop, run outside, run uphill. But what about that person? The guy in a wheelchair or the lady in a wheelchair. What about these people? People with families, pregnant women, uh, elderly people. They can't run as fast up that hill. So they, are, they, have an, so they have their own set of vulnerabilities. We have to be worried about when we design evacuation plans like this. Because in Izmit, two years ago, in um, 2020, late in 2020, there was an earthquake in Izmir, Western Turkey. In the, middle, in the middle of the pandemic. Hey, we haven't thought about pandemics, right? What did we do in, in, in the last two years? We were in lockdown. We were all inside our homes. Imagine if you had an earthquake then, which is exactly what happened in Croatia, in Zagreb, in the middle of a lockdown. You're all, you're now you're more exposed to that shaking because you're all inside. In any normal day, it's half the population is outdoors doing something about work or whatever. Everyone was in lockdown. So that, you might, we have to think about all these scenarios now. You know, in Izmir, the earthquake is a small earthquake, triggered a small tsunami about this big. And everyone, most, there's only one fatality because everyone did the right thing. The shaking stopped, they ran outside, they ran, up, they ran uphill. But from one lady in a wheelchair and she got washed away. But even with a tsunami this high, she got washed away. Unfortunately, it was the only fatality in the earthquake. So we need to be thinking about all this as hazard scientists. When we talk to governments and we talk to people making decisions, we need to say, okay, the evacuation plan, for your sort of healthy male, it's good. What about everyone else, right? We need to care, we have to care. We can't leave anyone behind when we design evacuation and mis mitigation plans. What happens as well, after that pair happens, this guy, this person's on a slope, earthquake shake ground. <laughs> and so that, those slopes are also gonna be unstable. So we need to put, Plan. You know, we don't have to, this is not a scary story, it's for you. It's more so that we put measures in place to stop these things, eventualities coming about. So, I mean, there are simple things we can do to make these people safe. It's just, we need to make sure we're communicating that to the people making the decisions at the time. And often coastal cities are there because there is also a river. And you know, these landslides blocked the river and there's a flood in a few months later, two, few weeks later. So that whole set of another vulnerabilities open up. So what I was trying to say is that the changes to the exposure and vulnerability of people and buildings and infrastructure is dynamic. It changes over time, depending on how one, one event, the cascade of events that are going to come about. So we, we can't just think of a vulnerability as a static thing. We have to be, think of it as an evolving thing. It's, it, uh, volcanoes are a really good example of this. Volcanic eruptions last for months sometimes. So before the eruption, you, you, you lived here, you had a certain vulnerability. After the eruption, you've been evacuated to here. You now have a different set of vulnerabilities, depending on where you are and who you are and the ability of your ability to have an income, feed your family, because all your farmlands over there on the volcano. And that's been erupting for the last four months. So you're, you're not growing any of your food. So we need to worry about this. We need to think about this. And we can. This is not a, sad, this is not a bad story. We can answer these problems, depending on where we live. So to summarize, uh, despite all the morbidity that I talked about today, 
Uh, earthquakes simply are caused by the release of strain energy in the ground in a sudden way that causes ground to shake. Most fatalities in earthquakes are caused by events that are between magnitude 7 and magnitude 8 in the middle of the continent, away from the subduction zones. Uh, and the vulnerabilities from exposure, poverty, corruption, and ignorance, i.e. the four horsemen, is what turns a natural hazard into a disaster. Disaster is always a human construct. Disasters are always about people. And now we, live, we, we understand that we live in a complex, multi-hazard world. We need to understand that when we're designing sort of plans and ev evacuation routines, we need to make sure we take everyone with us on that dynamic sort of evolving vulnerability landscape. We need to understand that it's not just about the physical still hazards now. We need to understand sociology. We need to be all psychologists. We need to all be sociologists if we want to be good disaster risk scientists as well. And with that, I'll end there. Thank you.